services is cheaper than turning them on and turning them off right. and then coming back. Yeah, I've heard that uh, uh-huh. when you turn the light switch on, yeah. it, it, has, oh, that it takes more okay. energy Thank than you, it does to burn that light for six hours. That's, what, that's exactly what he was saying. Just the start of it. Yeah. Only it just takes so much energy. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's exactly what he said. I hate to leave them on all day, but I don't think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had never left him on, but that's just what he was saying. He said, you'd be better off to leave the lights on all day. And I uh, thought, now, seems to be a waste of electricity. Leave, nobody in here. But. Leave them on all day. I can't go along with that. Yeah. Now, if you're going to leave a room and be gone just for, for a few minutes. minutes. Yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. yeah. But, but coming in here and leaving at 12 and coming back at 6, that's 6 hours. Yeah. I'll give you a list so you'll know. I made you a list today. There you go. All right. Oh. Oh, welcome. Everybody, have mercy, please. Didn't do it all. Thank you. Oh, that'll be you.
Do it in love.
just sing here. We're going to sing. I don't know. Are you singing that? Did you bring anything? I got my, I got my special. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. That's all we need, man. That's the special. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have to do it. Do you like it or not? Yes, sir. I love it. I love it. You know me. He's going to talk me in. It's about time to get started, everyone. Appreciate you coming out today. Grace Baptist Church, we want to welcome you to our service. We are live, going across the airwaves from the whole uh, United States to all around the world today. We're on Facebook Live. And I know we'll have Diane up there watching. She always watches. Hey, Diane, uh, from Green Bay. Keep her in your prayers. Anybody else with a special request? I think Martha said her sister has cancer. Let's pray for her. Uh, Gary? Just remember, Mr. Swanson, I still ain't heard nothing from you. Yeah. I don't know what's going on with him or what not. Okay. And uh, his niece that I talked to, she had very little uh, from, from who? Okay. So we need to keep them in our prayers, Mr. Swanson. Over at the women's hospital. Yeah, we there where they put all the COVID patients. Yeah. They put him there and didn't even, didn't even have the results from the test. Yeah. Wow. Rusty man, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. So we need to pray he doesn't catch it because he doesn't have it. He had pneumonia, a little yeah. touchy pneumonia. And uh, so they put him over in the women's hospital. Mr. Swanson. Okay, Chris. Um, there's a gentleman. shaking up. She had somebody come break in her house while she was there. But they didn't harm her. Thank the Lord for that. All right. And uh, Mama says now uh, that's a big thing to do. Not doing 
way of she has the uh, dementia. Is that right, or Parkinson's? Oh, I think she's Oh, she's got some other kind of yeah. symptoms. Let's keep Bobby in our prayer. All right. Okay. Let's just keep calling your so much. I appreciate that, Paul. All right. Uh, we don't have that many announcements to make, but we do have, uh, of course, some birthdays. Anybody here with a birthday? Uh, no birthdays. All right. How about uh, anybody here with an anniversary? I think my wife's supposed to be here. We got one coming up on the 28th. Uh, so, Dad, you want to come and sing? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, she's not here. I'll stand in her place. Yeah, all right. You just stand right there and I'll sing for you. Uh, all right. <laughs> Happy uh, birthday. No, my anniversary. Happy anniversary. anniversary. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is my hair. Okay, good. Sounds good. Okay, Joe, go ahead. Got some more coming in. I tell you, it's like a bad dream and you just can't wake up. It's it's just it's a weird feeling. Yep. Come on in. Got their mask on, ready to go. Yep. I'm not on an ego trip I'm nothing on my own I make mistakes and all 
just live. Just come and pray and moan. But I'll prove someday just why I say I'm of a special kind. Music up. Because when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. A look of love was on his face, the thorns upon his head. The blood was on his scarlet robe and stained then crimson red though his eyes were on the crowd that day he looked ahead in time and when he was on the cross I was on Study this passage. 
Paul is the writer, and uh, he gives us about three different qualities that we need in our life if we're going to have a lot of friends. And uh, how many of you would like to have more friends? Anybody like to have more friends? Anybody here don't have one friend? Well, everybody's got at least one. Because you got the Lord with you, right? But uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 9, down through verse number 18. Uh, verse 9 through 18 here. And uh, notice what it says. For to do this in Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, uh, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And let us not therefore judge one another any more, but rather this that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him, it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, uh, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ, he is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get right into our passage. Father, thank you for the time we have to be able to study, to learn, to grow. Help us to develop these qualities in our life. Lord, help us to be more like Jesus. Father, we thank you that we can come together and ask you to fill us afresh in with your precious Holy Spirit. For it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Heard about a little five-year-old boy who went to Sunday school and after the class, his daddy asked him, said, well, what did they teach you? And the little boy said, well, Dad, the teacher told us that Moses and all the children of Israel got to the Red Sea. And when they got down to the Red Sea, God just built a concrete bridge so they can all cross over. And his daddy's eyes got big and said, did they really teach you that? And he said, well, if you heard what they really said, you'd never believe it. <laughs> you'd never believe it. God parted the Red Sea, didn't he? Yes, he did. Uh, I also heard about a owner, when we talk here about being good to one another and learning how to talk to one another and not offending one another over little things, um, and there's a lot of things in Scripture that we have to obey. If God said it, that settles it. It's, it there's no debate there. But you know, there's a whole lot of questionable in life. There's some things in life, and sometimes we think, well, I'm right and everybody else is wrong, and there's no even Scripture to back it up. And so we, I heard about an owner in a manufacturing plant. He decided he was going to go in this plant and make a surprise visit, check everybody out, make sure they're doing their jobs. He noticed a young man just lazily leaning up against some packing crates and his hands were in his pocket. He was doing nothing. So the boss walked up to him with anger in his eyes said, Son, how much are you paid a week? And the young man's eyes got rather large. He said, About $500. And the boss pulled out of his wallet and peeled off five $100 bills, gave them to him. He said, Here's a week's pay. Get out of here and don't ever come back. And so without a word, the young man stuffed the money into his pocket, took off. The warehouse manager, standing nearby, simply staring in amazement. And the boss walked over to him and said, I want to ask you a question. How long has that lazy guy been working for us? And the manager said, he doesn't work here. He's just delivering a package. <laughs> Better watch out, huh? He just lost $500. Somebody has said this. Before you judge a book by its cover, be sure you have read the table of contents. Before we judge a person, get on a person, we better realize that person may be having a hard time. And that person may be going through a rough time. Right. And everybody's having a hard time these days, I'm telling you. Uh, Gandhi, the Buddhist leader of India, when he was a young man, he decided Christianity and the teachings of Christ would help his 
people there in India with the caste system they have. They got the very rich and the very poor, and they are very, very poor. And so he read the scriptures and read the teachings of Jesus, and he went to a church. And when he went to the church, they wouldn't even put him in a seat in the Christian church because they looked at him and thought, well, he's a Buddhist. Uh, we don't want any trouble in our church. And he left there and became a Hindu, that's what it is. He became a, a Hindu follower and left the whole Christian religion over that one incident because they wouldn't let him sit in the church. And I got to thinking, what an influence he would have had over an entire country had somebody used a little bit of common sense and not been so hasty to judge it. So the first thing we have to remember is this. If we're going to have a lot of friends or if we're going to have a lot of Companions avoid judging other people. Avoid judging other people. Yeah. That's the tendency in this church. The background is this. They had idols in their day, and they had meat that was offered up to the idols. And so they would sell this meat at a discount, and the Christians, the real strong Christians, knew there's nothing to those idols. They're just a piece of wood, a piece of glass, a piece of clay. There's only one God. And so they would offer, let's say, a $5 steak for $1. And they would buy it, the real strong ones, but the weak Christian would say, hey, wait a minute, I'm not going to eat that piece of steak because that's been offered to a false god. There's probably demons in it. And so you had to divide in the church. And some of the ones who knew better, they were offending the weaker brother by eating the meat offered to sacrifices. And so what happened was it left a bad taste in the mouth of the young believers that just had gotten saved and just had thought, you know, everything's great in the church and everybody loves each other and all of a sudden I get this person and they're eating that meat that's been offered to an idol. So he is saying here, be very, very careful. Be very careful. We have to remember here that the tendency was that those who knew their liberties in Jesus would eat that meat that had been offered to the idols, knowing the idol is nothing. And they were considered the stronger Christian because they understood no food is morally wrong to eat. I mean, over in the book of Acts, Peter's on the housetop and the sheet is lowered down. And God told Peter to go in that sheet and eat all kinds of meats. Now, in the Old Testament, he did forbid them to eat pork, uh, shrimp, all catfish, uh, if it didn't have a scale on it, you couldn't eat it as far as the fish goes. So, in the Old Testament, God gave them very strict dietish, dietary laws. But in the New Testament, he said, just reach your hand in there and grab it. And Peter said, I'm not going to eat that unclean meat. And God said, what I've called clean, don't you call unclean. And really what he's preparing Peter for is to go to the Gentiles. He went and won Cornelius, the first Gentile, saved in the church there. To the Lord. And so when he came back, the church jumped all over Peter. Said, What are you doing talking to those filthy Gentiles? And Peter said, Hey, God told me to go down there and talk to that man. He might be a Roman soldier. He is a centurion, meaning he's over about a hundred men. But God told me he was a good man and he needed to know the plan of salvation. And so the church finally figured, Hey, wait a minute. If God's for this, who are we to tell you you can't witness to a Gentile? Because in those days, most Jews looked down upon the Gentiles as being lower than a dog or a pig or what else you could think of. Yeah. So you have to remember now, we're looking at non-moral preferences. The weaker brother, the weaker Christian, or maybe the one that had just gotten saved out of that lifestyle of, of offering meat to idols and all the rest of it. See, in their mind, they still thought, hey, there's probably a demon in that. I can remember offering these meats to these idols, and now I'm saved from all of that. Here they, are, here they are eating the meat. And so the weaker Christian complained that the meat they had offered should not be eaten because it had been desecrated in the process. So, as I said, we're just looking at preferences now, not sins. If God said it, that settles it. It's a sin to do certain things. God gave ten commandments. They're not up for debate. But if the Bible clearly states an issue is wrong and sinful, then we ought to obey God rather than man. 
We always obey the Bible. We stay away from those issues of sin as far away as we can. Yes. And we have to realize this. Everyone is welcome here at Grace Baptist Church. I mean, if they're breathing, God cares about them. Why? Because they have a soul. And so we need to witness. We need to tell them the gospel. We need to show them the spirit of Christ. We need to embrace them and let them know, man, we welcome you into our church. We're not a bunch of cliques. We're not going to stick our nose up. Why? Because God doesn't approve of that thing. He doesn't like those who sow discord in the church. And there are some, that's one of the things he hates. People that go around sowing discord, getting everybody upset, one with another, and before you know it, the whole church is walking on eggshells. Yeah. And God said that shouldn't be. So remember now, God has accepted both the weaker Christian and the stronger Christian who knows better. And he will sustain them with his mighty power. So that keeps us from having to try to straighten everybody out. Because if we're not careful, we think, boy, I'm way up here, they're way down there, and I'm straight them out. And we're, we're playing the role of the Pharisees. So look back, if you will, at verse 3 and verse number 4. Then let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. Well, not for God received them all. So he's saying there, quit fussing among yourself over a little piece of meat. <laughs> Quit fussing over the color of the carpet. <laughs> Quit fussing over the toilet paper in the bathroom. You say, that's are just trivial things. You know, I've heard of churches splitting over those things. And it's terrible. And most things are not even worth the battle that people put up for it. And so God will take care of his children. If he accepts us, who are we to refuse one of God's children? I believe we're getting caught right here in the middle of the church. Uh, it'll go away here in just a second. But anyway, the Christian life, we have to remember this. If we can relax and let God take care of the other Christians and their convictions and their preferences, we're not talking about sinful things. We're talking about non-essential things. Now look, if you will, at verse number, moving on down here to verse number five. Uh, back to verse number five here. Um... No, I'm sorry, verse number 9. Go down to verse number 9, if you will. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Paul says that we're to allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord who died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and even revived. The word revived there simply means to be made alive. That's why you call a revival we are revived. We're back to life for Jesus Christ. And so we know that our loved ones are in heaven who are in Christ. And one day we're all going to be resurrected. And one day, thank God, we're all going to be made like Jesus. And uh, so Jesus revived back to life, gained his strength, got his vigor, and now he has a glorified body. He is Lord of all who come to him, both the living and the dead. Yes. Aren't you glad yes. that death doesn't separate believers permanently? Right. Think about this. We're going to see our loved ones. They're in heaven. Yes. And because of the death and burial and the resurrection of Christ, I'll see my mom again. Yes. I'll see my sister again. I'll see darling again. I'll see Fred Whitaker again. I mean, there's all of these people just in the last few weeks. We've watched them, and boy, we loved them, and now they're gone to heaven. But one day there's coming to that. And we'll see our loved ones again. Thank God for that. Why? Because Jesus died, was buried, rose again. So look at verse number 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou sit it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So he's introduced us now to a judgment that Christians one day will participate in. The judgment seat of Christ. And so he is saying here, he knows all the details. He's the only one qualified to be a judge. I don't know the details in somebody else's life. Who am I to be their judge? And somebody else may not know what I'm going through. And who are they to be my judge? Or who am I to be their judge? Why? Because there's only one who knows it all. 
And that's the Lord. He is the great judge. And one day he will judge us all. Not for our sins. Thank God our sins are washed and cleansed, just like we preached the other week. Yeah. They're buried and gone. They'll never be brought up against us again, but he will judge us for our works. What did we do for the Lord? Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble. And so, think about this. When we say, well, that person's not a Christian, or that person's not doing what God wants them to do, sometimes we get the idea that we've got the authority that only God has. And only He has that authority to judge that person. Now, we're to preach the Word. We're to follow after the Word. But we're not to be the judge. There's only one judge. That word judge there carries the idea to distinguish, to decide, to try, or even condemn or punish. So to pass sentence upon. Have we ever been guilty of any of these actions? Passing sentence on somebody? Guilty of talking someone down? If we've done that, we've jumped to conclusions that we should never have jumped to. So Paul then asked us, why have we set at naught our brother? In verse number 10. That word naught, very important word, it means to be contemptible to, to despise. And so he's talking here about why is it that sometimes we condemn another person? Why is it we despise people? Why is it we're trying to do the job that only God can do? Why? He's the righteous guy. He's the only judge who knows all the facts. I'm reminded of a story of a man and his son. And they were in a local general store. And this was back in the day of the horse and buggies. And so the man parked his horse and his wagon outside the store. And he and his son went in for a moment. He bought his son a piece of candy. And his son said, I'm going to go wait on you in the wagon. He said, go ahead, son. i got to get some groceries. So while his daddy was in there getting the groceries, this four-year-old boy was sitting in the wagon all alone. Something spooked the horse and took off, and that little boy was in the wagon all by himself. And he was hanging on for life because the horse was running and galloping. And there was a man on the other side of the street down the road just a little bit who took off running and got there just in time to jump in that cart, hold the reins of the horse, and save the little boy's life. They were so grateful to that man. And they thought, they thanked him and thanked him and thanked him. 25 years later, that four-year-old boy is now a 29-year-old man. And in the past 25 years, he had lived a life of crime, immorality, wickedness. Finally, one day, he was arrested and brought into the courtroom. And as he stood before the bench, he looked up and he noticed the judge was the very same man who had saved his life 25 years ago. And the man asked the judge, do you remember that incident? And the judge acknowledged, yes, I do. I remember it. And then the judge expressed his regret that this young man had not been more of a model citizen, more of an outstanding citizen. And as he looked over the bench into the face of the young man, here's what he said. 25 years ago, I was your savior. But today, I'm your judge. And you know, that's kind of the way it is today with Christ. He is our savior now. Thank God we can come to Him as our Savior. He washes us. He cleanses us. He saves us to the glory of God. Yes. But one day He'll be our judge. And so we need to do what's pleasing to Him. And instead of being the judge and judging everybody around us and looking down upon those who may be a little weaker in nature and not knowing everything maybe they all know, they're just growing. They're little babes in Christ. They may not know any better. And instead of jumping on them, and letting them have it with both barrels, maybe we need to be a little more patient. Maybe we need to really think, hey, you know, I was there one time. I was a young Christian one time. I, when I first got saved, you wouldn't believe it. Now, I don't have much hair up there. I've lost about all of my hair. So whenever I find some in the strainer, I say, God, I'll be with you till we meet again one day. And one day I'll have a full head of hair again. But you know, when I first got saved, I had long hair. And even had a little beard. And nobody jumped on me. And uh, I think what happened, they knew, hey, that young man's been saved. I was only 18. And you know, the Holy Spirit dealt with me. And he told me what I need to do. And of course, they were preaching morality and they were preaching, you know, uh, representing Christ and going out and 
letting people know about the Lord. And, and the Holy Spirit took care of me without somebody cornering me in a, in a building somewhere and jumping on me because I didn't know anything. I mean, and I'm not jumping on anybody else who may choose to have long hair. I'll let the Holy Spirit do that. Why? Because he is their judge. God is their judge. We're all going to bow. Thank God one day we're going to bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. So we need to be slow to be the judge of others. You know, Adolf Hitler one day is going to bow to Jesus. Do you realize that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God? That's why I don't get so caught up in clothing styles or hairstyles or even music or preaching and teaching and leadership. They're all different. People have different ways. If somebody is ministering for Jesus Christ, I say throw them a bone and encourage them. Amen? R.G., I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Robertson, Lee Robertson up at Chattanooga, he's passed on now, but I can remember he preached uh, in this church before I ever came. They told me Dr. Robertson came here years ago. But I heard him preach at another church, and he said something I never forgot. He said, sometimes we're too quick to judge people about what they're doing for the Lord and how they're doing it for the Lord. He said, but if a dog came through town barking Jesus, I'd throw him a bone. And you know, I never forgot that. I said, you know, who am I to be a judge? Who am I to jump on anybody else? If God is leading them to do it a different way, praise God, we're on the same team through Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be their judge. God is their judge. Yes. And so that's why he says here in verse number 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee's going to bow, every tongue going to confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. It is written, he quotes, if you want to write down the side, verse 11, he is quoting Isaiah 45, verse 23, and Isaiah 49, verse number 18. And we're all bowed one day, and we're going to confess that Jesus is the Lord. Now, be very careful about preferences. Be very careful about styles. Why? Because they come in many different shapes, come in many different sizes. And if somebody's trying to do something for the Lord, I'm going to try to encourage them. I'm going to try to lift them up. I'll try to help them. Why? Because I know what it's like to be attacked by the devil. And I know what it's like to be forsaken by friends. I know what it's like to have that old nature and the devil accusing you of every little thing maybe that you've done wrong in the past. Thank God when he does that, I say, hey, devil, get out of here. Resist Satan. Claim the blood of Jesus. He has to flee in the sight of God. I'm a child of the Lord. Amen. I'm a child of the King. I'm as perfect as Jesus is. Not in my own righteousness, but all of my sins have been applied to Jesus and all of his righteousness has been applied to me. Thank God for that. If I'd getting saved off of my good works, I'd never make it. Nobody else would either. Because just one sin's enough to keep a person out of heaven. Did you know one little lie is enough to keep a person out? But God will wash and cleanse that record and there'll be no record of sin when he gets finished with it. Verse number 12. Let's move on. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now here's another reason we need to be very careful of judging other believers because they're going to have to give account of themselves one day. We're going to have to give account of ourselves one day. We don't know what that person has been through in life, nor do we know the motivation behind their actions. So let us be very cautious about criticizing other believers on issues that are not read in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, we have to be very careful because we're standing on some, some pretty shaky sand there. Now, if it's in the Bible, you take a stand. And you say, God said it, I believe it. And whether I believe it or not, it settles it. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Every person's accountable to the Lord. Not to others, but to the Lord. So while the church must be uncompromising, we stand against sin. We stand against that which is forbidden in the scriptures. We're talking about adultery or homosexuality or murder or theft. All of those things, we know we have to take a strong stand for that which is right. But we have to be careful about somebody's preferences, things that they like to do. It's not against the scripture. And so if they're a little bit weak and they don't know yet, I'm not going to do something that's going to offend them. I'm not going to do something that's going to mess them up. 
I heard this story. It's a true story. Billy Graham told it. And Dwight D. Eisenhower, one of the great generals of the Second War, and of course became our president. Everybody liked him. Dwight D. Eisenhower. He served several terms as our president. And one week he was vacationing in Denver, Colorado, and it came to his attention there was a six-year-old boy named Paul Haley who was dying of an incurable cancer. And he had one dream in life, and that was to one day meet the president. Somebody told Dwight about it. And Eisenhower said to one of his aides, let's go see this young man, Paul Haley. So they took off and got in the presidential limousine and drove over. One August Sunday afternoon, and there was little Paul Haley. And he had no idea the president was coming to see him. And, and so flags were on the fenders, and they were flying as the limousine came down the road and doors opened, and out walked the president and knocked on the front door. Donald Haley, the father, was wearing blue jeans and an old dirty shirt and a day's growth of beard and holes in his pants. He opened the door and said, yeah, can I help you? He didn't know who it was. And the president said, is Paul here? Tell him the president wants to see him. And little Paul, to his amazement, was standing right behind his daddy. He looked around through his legs, and there stood the president, the man he admired the most, who wanted to see before he left this world. And Eisenhower kneeled down and picked him up and carried him out in the presidential, uh, presidential limousine and drove him around the block and brought him back and said goodbye and hugged him. They shook hands and left. And what an exciting time that was for everybody except for Donald Haley. And he said, how could I ever forget? There I was, dressed in old blue jeans with holes in them and a dirty shirt and an unshaven face, and I'm talking to the President of the United States. <laughs> and you know, he regretted meeting him that way. And yet, there's coming a day when we're going to meet the Lord. And we want to meet him in the right condition. And we don't want to meet him condemning everybody, running people down, or running from him, we want to meet him doing the will of God. Look at verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So Paul concludes this admonition by saying that not only should we be careful about passing judgment, but we're to do everything possible not to hinder their walk with the Lord. The word stumbling block. In the Greek language, that means an obstacle somebody puts in front of someone to try to trip them up. And so they stumble over that. He's saying there, don't be an obstacle in somebody's walk with the Lord. If it's just a little opinion, if it's just a little preference, it's not even worth fighting about. It's not even worth jumping on them about. Are, are we a stumbling block or are we a stepping stones? See, the choice is ours to make. And we make that choice. God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So, thank God we can refrain from judging other people. Yes. If a believer is convinced a certain behavior is sin, even if I know it's not a sin, I'm not going to do it in front of them because I don't want them to be hurt by my actions. I, I, you know, it's just a thing of preferences. Years ago, I, I don't drink and I don't I, I don't condone drinking. I just I'm just a total abstinence when it comes to drinking. That's just how I feel. And I know different people feel different ways. But I was at a wedding one time. I did the wedding, and they made a toast with champagne. And everybody had the champagne glasses, and of course they was going around filming the whole thing and making pictures of it. And I thought to myself, I better be very careful. Because I preached this all my life, so I picked up a regular glass and put some Coke in it, and I drank the Coke, and I toasted it with my Coke. And I thought, I don't want them to think, hey, he's up there preaching, but then he's running around here taking these champagne drinks at the, at the wedding. I don't want a testimony like that. I want to be the same on Monday as I am on Sundays. And that's the way the Lord wants it. Why? Because he can come back at any time. Listen to this scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 Abstain from all appearance of evil. If he's saying if it looks wrong, just stay away from it. Don't even entertain it in your mind. I don't want people to think he's preaching one thing and practicing another. Why? Because that's hypocrisy. That's play acting. 
The Lord doesn't want us to do that. Go back, if you will, we'll finish this up. Romans chapter number 14, verse number 16. Let not then your evil, or I mean, let not then your good be evil spoken of. Now this happens when we refuse to use love and restraint, and we insist on having it our own way. Other people are offended by our insults, our actions. They get offended by that. So he's summing up what he said in this passage. There's going to be many different ways of thinking and many different preferences in every church on all kinds of issues. For, as I said, from the color of the carpet to the style of the worship to even the music and even, like I said, the toilet paper in some places. Don't let those things become something that you would divide a church over. Every church is a mixture with different kind of believers. Therefore, we should all strive to keep the peace in the church out of our love for God and our love one for another. And there will be something that you do not particularly care about, but be a peacemaker. That's, That's number two. Be a peacemaker. Yeah. That's what God wants us to be. Don't be a judge. Be a peacemaker. And you'll have more friends than you can count. Right. Look at verse 17. The kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> have you ever seen anybody look like they've been weaned on a deal pit? <laughs> <laughs> and they've got, a, they've got a, a stick on their shoulder just daring you to knock the stick off. And nobody wants to be around that type of an atmosphere. They don't want to be around that type of a person. Why? Because they're going to get their head bit off. Years and years ago, I had a preacher friend. He was kind of that way. And he'd get mad, and he'd blow up, and boy, he'd let you have it, but then he'd feel bad 10 minutes later. He'd apologize. And I said, you know, that's great, and I accept your apologies. But you know, the damage can already be done now. It's like erupting a volcano. When you lose your temper, you just let the lava flow with whoever it hits. And you have to be careful. Ask God to help you with that temper. Sometimes we better go count to ten. What we say in Sometimes we better go count to a hundred, right? But what he's saying there, the kingdom of God is not made up of these things. See, they was all upset about, did you eat that meat given to that idol? Did you practice this holy day? Did you do this and that? Did you keep all the Sabbaths? And he said, these are disputable subjects. Diet. And all these things. The main point of the passage is this. Thank God we know that our salvation is based on the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the judge. We're just the body. And therefore, we love one another, pray one for another, encourage one another. And one day, thank God, we're all going home, one with another. Yes. Look at verse number 18. For he that is in these things serveth Christ. He is acceptable to God. He is approved of man. The servant of God strives after righteousness, peace, and joy, and he or she is a peacemaker. They're not a divider. They're a peacemaker. God will approve of that person. People love to be around that kind of a person. Why? Because they will speak blessings into your life, and they've got a vision of what God can do in your life. But others, you know what I'm saying. It's like, oh, me. Here comes the end of the world. And friends, as long as God's on the throne, the end of the world is not here yet. He is still on the throne. God wants us to make spiritual giants, not for us, but for him. Approved to men. That doesn't mean that men will get in your cheering section and applaud you for being a believer. There are some people, they're going to make fun of you for being a believer. I remember, as I said before, they would be people calling me preacher man and all this. I just been saved. I wasn't a preacher. But I love to read my Bible and I love to pass tracts out and tell people about the Lord. And you know, I realized this. They may not like all of that, but they respect me because when they got in a bind, they'd ask me to pray for them. And they'd say, would you pray for me? I thought you didn't like me. I thought you didn't like my Christianity. Well, I'm not all that big of a Bible thumper, but I know you get a hold of the Lord. I want you to pray for me. And you know it changes their heart. So underneath I always remember, we're the only Bible some people are going to read. Yes. Are they going to read good things or are they going to read bad things? They're not going to take the Bible and read it. So number one, avoid judging others. And number two, be a peacemaker. Respect 
others' opinion. Don't look down upon them. When you look down upon them, that's not the spirit of Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you're here today and you've never been saved. If you'd like to know the Lord, he loved you. He died for you with buried roads again. If you'd like to be saved today, in your heart, would you pray something like this? Dear Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. Thank you for dying in my place on the cross. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Save my soul. Make me a home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads about and eyes are closed. If you made that decision in your heart, you prayed and asked the Lord to be your Savior. Would you just look up, and I'll know you by looking up, you made that decision. I'll pray for you today. Anyone, anywhere? Preacher, just pray for me. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Maybe today you'd say, I know the Lord, and I'm so glad I'm saved. Pray for me. I've got a burden on my heart. I've got some needs in my life, and I want to be a peacemaker. I don't want to be a divider. I know. I believe that's your desire. I'll be glad to pray for you. Anyone like that, you just lift my hand up all around the room. Hands are lifted everywhere. Father, Thank you for the day you give us. Thank you, Lord, for this time we can come and pray, one for another. And, Lord, let us keep the spirit of Christ alive among us, that spirit of love and hope and encouragement and blessing. And, Lord, bless each one that raised a hand, those for salvation. I pray you'll just give them strength to walk with you and talk with you and stay in church. And, Father, I pray that you'll bless us all as we raise our hand. We want to be your representative wherever you lead us and guide us. And we'll thank you for it and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand our feet while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you want to come around the altar, I think Paul's going to play on the harmon uh, harmonica, just as I am, as he does. If you want to come down and pray, you feel free to come. Just as I am. Without one play. But that thy blood was shed for me. Amen. Just like we are. Let's give him a big amen. Ready? Hey. Amen. Thank God for this. Well, I hope you can stay for Sunday school. I think Joe's going to teach Sunday school today. The youth started meeting again on Wednesday nights at 7, Ryan and Chrissy. And it's good to see these youth here today. And uh, so we appreciate that. Joe, if you would, you dismiss us. And I think you wanted to add something if you, as we finish. Brother Joe.